My lords, we are neither lawyers nor masters of English language, nor holders of degrees. Therefore, please do not expect any oratorial speech from us. We therefore pray that instead of going into the language mistakes of our statement, your lordships will try to understand the real sense of it. Leaving other points to our lawyers, I will confine myself to one point only. The point is very important in this case. The point is as to what were our intentions and to what extent we are guilty. This is a very complicated question and no one will be able to express before you that height to mental elevation which inspired us to think and act in a particular manner. We want that this should be kept in mind while assessing our intentions, our offense. According to the famous jurist Solomon, one should not be punished for his criminal offense if his aim is not against law. We had submitted a written statement in the Sessions Court. That statement explains our aim and, as such, explains our intentions also, but the lean judge dismissed it with one stroke of pen, saying that generally the operation of law is not affected by how or why one committed the offense. In this country the aim of the offense is very rarely mentioned in legal commentaries, my lords. Our contention is that under the circumstances the learned judge ought to have judged to see the by. The result of our action are on the basis of the psychological part of our statement. But he did not take any of these factors into consideration. The point to be considered is that the two bombs we threw in the assembly did not harm anybody. Physically or economically. As such the punishment awarded to us is not only very harsh but revengeful also, moreover, the motive knowing his psychology, and no one can do justice to anybody without taking his motive into consideration. If we ignore the motive, the biggest general of the words will appear like ordinary murderers. Revenue officers will look like thieves and cheats, even judges will be accused of murder. This way the entire social system and the civilization will be reduced to murders, thefts and cheating. If we ignore the motive, the government will have no right to expect sacrifice from its people and its officials. Ignore the motive and every religious preacher will be dubbed as a preacher of falsehoods. And every prophet will be charged of misguiding crawls of simple and ignorant people. If we set aside the motive, then Jesus Christ will appear to be a man responsible for creating disturbances, breaking peace and preaching revolt, and will be considered to be a dangerous personality in the language of the law. But we worship him. He commands great respect in our hearts and his image creates vibrations of spiritualism amongst us. Why? Because the inspiration behind his actions was that of a high ideal. The rulers of that age could not recognize that high idealism. They only saw his outward actions. Nineteen centuries have passed since then. Have we not progressed during this period? Shall we repeat that mistake again? If that be so, then we shall have to admit that all the sacrifices of the mankind and all the efforts of the great martyrs were useless and it would appear as if we are still at the same place where we stood twenty centuries back. From the legal point of view also, the question of motive is of special importance. Take the example of General Dyer. He resorted to firing and killed hundreds of innocent and unarmed people. But the military court did not order him to be shot. It gave him lakhs of rupees as a ward. Take another example. Sri Karak Bahada Singh, a young Gurkha, killed a Marwari in Calcutta. If the motive be set aside, then Karak Bahada Singh ought to have been hanged. But he was awarded a mild sentence of a few years only. He was even released much before the expiry of his sentence. Was there any loophole in the law that he escaped capital punishment, or was the charge of murder not proved against him, like us? He also accepted the full responsibility of his action, but he escaped death, he is free today. I ask your lordship, why was he not awarded capital punishment? His action was well calculated and well planned, from the motive end. 
His action was more serious and fatal than ours. He was awarded a mild punishment because his intentions were good. He was awarded a mild punishment because his intention were good. He saved the society from a dirty leech who had sucked the lifeblood of so many pretty young girls. Karig Singh was given a mild punishment just to uphold the formalities of the law. This principle that the law does not take motive into consideration, ed, is quite absurd. This is against the basic principles of the law which declares that the law is for man and not man, for the law. As such, why the same norms are not being applied to is also. It is quite clear that while convicting Karig Singh, his motive was kept in mind. Otherwise a murderer can never escape the hangman's noose. Are we being deprived of the ordinary advantage of the law because our offense is against the government? But because our action has a political importance, my lords, under these circumstances, please permit us to assert that a government which seeks shelter behind such mean methods has no right to exist. If it is exists, it is for the time being only. And that too with the blood of thousands of people on its head. If the law does not see the motive there can be no justice, nor can there be stable peace. Mixing of arsenic poison in the flower will not be considered to be a crime, provided its purpose is to kill rats, but if the purpose is to kill a man, it becomes a crime of murder. Therefore, such laws which do not stand the test of reason and which are against the principle of justice, should be abolished because of such unjust laws. Many great intellectuals had to adopt the path of revolt. The facts regarding our case are very simple. We threw two bombs in the Legislative Assembly on April 8, 1929, as a result of the explosion. A few persons received minor scratches, there was pandemonium in the chamber. Hundreds of visitors and members of the Assembly ran out, only my friend BK. Dutt and myself remained seated in the visitors' gallery and offered ourselves for a rest. We were tried for attempt to murder and convicted for life, as mentioned above. As a result of the bomb explosion, only four or five persons were slightly injured and one bench got damaged. We offered ourselves for arrest without any resistance. 